Hello, everyone, everywhere. This is Bob Thibodeau with the Kingdom Crossroads podcast, and you are listening to the Going North podcast with my good friend, Dom Brightman. Be sure to subscribe to his podcast so you will not miss any of the upcoming episodes. And be blessed in all that you do. And today on the Going North podcast, we're back at you again with another author, but not just any author. We got one heck of a special lady in the house for you today. That's right. This wonderful lady right here, she is a nurse with over 35 years of experience in the health care field, and not just the U.S. of A. either, also Canada and the U.K., and she's got a wonderful certification in gerontology and dementia care and is a passionate dementia advocate and educator. And for those who have been longtime listeners, you should probably know already why this wonderful lady's on this show indeed. She is a publicity maven because she appears on the TV as well as the interwebs and podcasts. And she gets that to go into the podcast, her repertoire of spreading the wonderful message of depression awareness as well as those who our caregivers who have dementia patients. And you're probably wondering who this wonderful lady right here, this wonderful overcomer. It's the wonderful, one and only, terrific Tracy Maxfield. How are you today, ma'am? Well, I'm a little speechless. That was quite an intro. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I got to make the intro good and sweet like honey. I I thought I was going to get a trumpet fanfare there for a moment. (laughs) Uh, maybe i'll edit that in who knows (laughs) sounds good (laughs) oh yes ma'am yes ma'am indeed well 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 first off before we continue any further just want to congratulate you on all of your success that is happening and all that is to come because you're also nominated for an author award right yes i am Yes, that was a very unexpected but pleasant surprise. So, yeah, best author um, nonfiction. That's right, baby, that's right. That's right, she's escaping the rabbit hole all the way to Valhalla, baby. Going to get a shiny medal, put it on the book, maybe put it on the forehead, maybe wear a gold dress to boot with some boots. Absolutely. Picking out the gun already. <laughs> Well, all right, just gave a short little glimpse into the wonderful land of Tracy Mine, telling us a bit about yourself and how you decided to become a nurse all the way to becoming an author. Okay, are you ready? (laughs) You'll probably need a drink. (laughs) I got plenty of water, don't worry. That's good, so have I. Okay, so um, born in Wales in the United Kingdom, Always wanted to be a nurse from the age of two. Used to sit and bandage my teddies, put on slings, things like that. Unfortunately, grew into an extremely abusive childhood. My father was very emotionally and physically abusive. And so it was quite a challenge in childhood. But from the age of five, watching a steady diet of TV, which included so many of the U.S. uh, shows, Um, I decided that I also wanted to come to the United States. And that kind of kept me going, wanting to be a nurse, wanting to come to the United States, when everything, all the horrors that were going on in my life, that kind of motivated me to keep going, keep going, you'll escape it one day. And then finally, at age 19, I was able to leave home and did my nurse studies. And then after I completed that, I tried to get into the United States, but it's a little bit more complicated than I thought. But as Britain is part of the Commonwealth countries and Canada is one of them, uh, I was able to get uh, a permit to actually come to Canada. I sat my Canadian nurse in equivalency exams and I've been here ever since. Arrived June 1987, so 31 and a half years ago. My passion has always been dementia. I worked in the very first dementia day center in Wales. So that's, oh my goodness, 35, 30, 38 years ago. Um, and that was an experiment. 
to see if caregivers and families would benefit from having their loved one with dementia. In those days, it was called senile dementia, um, in for a day or even for, to stay overnight. And of course, we know it was very successful because they're very common now. So fast forward, um, living in Canada, continued to nurse, got married, did my degree, uh, gerontology certification, dementia care practitioner certification. And then uh, I was in a a position at work where I was a team leader in a hospital, was subjected to endless bullying, intimidation, threats, harassment from a superior. Ended up having a massive nervous breakdown, which is acute depression. And in August 2015, and ultimately fell down the rabbit hole because that's what I likened it to. Uh, Worst experience ever. I had two previous depressive attacks during my life, but nothing compared to this. Suicide attempts planned took over two years. But uh, with my psychologist's encouragement, um, he advised that I started a blog and literally open my heart, tell people how frustrated I was with the way they treated me because there's so much stigma. And also to explain what exactly was going on in my head for them to get the down and dirty, if that's the the best phrase to use. And so the blog was very well received, read by social workers, doctors, nurses, psychologists who encouraged me to write a book. And so that's what I did. And in April last year, I released my first book, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, My Journey Through Depression. Um, has been very, very well received in the United States, actually better than in Canada, and ultimately started to get offers to speak on different podcasts, radio shows, and then invited to appear on TV. And so I've been on television in Seattle and in Washington State, I've now been asked to go to Kansas, return to Louisiana, this time to Baton Rouge, and I've also just a week ago been invited to present at Teach 2019 conference in Jacksonville, Florida. So here I am. (laughs) Oh, here you are indeed. Here you are indeed. And glad you're still here on the planet. Glad you didn't take your life and now you get to share your light with the rest of us. Well, I mean, the purpose of the book is that I don't want anyone else to go through what I did and feel that they're they're alone. There's millions of us out there. We're all going through something very, very similar. And I want them to know they're not alone and there is hope. I also want people caring for um, those who have depression to kind of read the book and have an understanding that we're not being lazy or difficult that, you know, unable to do anything, taking 30 minutes to clean our teeth is the norm when you're in that very deep, dark stage. And the book resonated so much with teenagers because I also have lots of illustrations in there and illustrations speak louder than words and they were able to identify and kind of it open to dialogue with them when I was at their schools giving presentations. And so that's why I decided to focus my platform on bullying, mental illness, suicide in children and teenagers, not only because of the stigma, but because a lot of people actually don't think that they could possibly have a mental illness, and they actually do. And so I really wanted to focus and bring attention to that. So as a community, we can all understand and work together to support our kids because, as you know, 16 teenagers are going to commit suicide today in the United States and tomorrow there's going to be another 16 and the day after that. And for those that don't succeed, the, the, the new numbers, so a week ago the number was 2,439 attempt suicide daily in the United States. On Friday, that number changed to 3,041. That's every single day in the States, kids right up to the age of 24 attempt suicide. And to me, that is scary and horrific because we are going to lose a younger generation. We're going to lose our, our future teachers and scientists and doctors and nurses 
and policemen and TV show hosts and podcast show hosts. Like we are going to lose people that have valuable gifts to share with us and it has to stop. And so that is why I'm very passionate about that. Yeah, that's a really good, strong platform to have because it's a very, very real thing nowadays, and it's been amplified thanks to social media and folks having channels such as Instagram and possibly Snapchat and other social media handles where once you put it out on the Internet, it's permanent. So it's like you don't just have to deal with the crap from your classmates or like possible colleagues. You have to deal with that mess for the rest of your life because someone out there is watching it. Yes. Cyberbullying is um, very much a contributory factor to why there has been an increase in mental illness and, in fact, in suicide. And, I mean, we've, I don't think we can ever stop um, the extent of cyberbullying because it will require governments around the world. But I think if we can educate and empower our kids, um, to deal with it and to know when to switch off and not respond, the better chance we have of saving them. But it's a very scary and very real problem. And Internet has many positives. It's a huge support and education forum when used properly. But you have to be very careful because there are some pedophiles, predators, I mean, catfish, you name it, right? Everyone is out there and you cannot trust anyone. You have to be so, so very careful what you post, what pictures you post. And there was an interesting um, post in one of the US newspapers yesterday that children as young as eight are being coerced to post naked pictures of themselves. Uh, and it, I mean, and of course they are believing that they are sharing it with boys their age, although that's still scary, but boys their age, is. and we know they're not. We know they're not, but it's, I mean, we're a community, a society where we all want to be loved and we all want to belong. And if you believe you have the cutest guy in school that's messaging you and making you feel special... And at eight, your brain is not developed enough to understand the consequences of posting something online that will be with you for the rest of your life. And that's the thing, right? We press delete, it's not gone. It's, and that's what these kids are not understanding. And, you know, they, it's risk taking. They think, oh, I'll just press delete. No one will know. I'm sorry to say, yes, they will. And that's a horrible thing to go into your adulthood, waiting for that to suddenly pop up in your life. And yes, so, you know, I say the more we start talking and sharing our stories, the better chance we have of kind of arming our kids to go into the future. It's like we're almost giving them battle gear to go into into their future a little bit more prepared. That's right. Got that battle-ready armor. That's right. Equip them, baby. Equip them. You have to. You absolutely have to. Um, you know, because they are, lots of parents are not there to support their kids, and they are using social media as a, as a family, as a support network. And we all know how easy it is, even as adults, to get conned by people. There's very clever people, but predators for children and teenagers are at an all-time high, and we've really got to start protecting them. Yeah, and have to be more, I guess, sophisticated in a way of how you protect your kids, too. I think especially, probably one way is probably not getting them smartphones a little too early. <laughs> well, and, and again, I mean, I know there's um, a woman in Britain who is campaigning. If you're not allowed to drive and you're not allowed to smoke and drink alcohol until in Britain, it's 17, 18. But whatever the age of consent, whenever the age that you were legally allowed to vote in a country, should that not be the age that you have a social media account? I mean, that's the, and I mean, it's, that's going to be hard because I think it's, it's important 
for teenagers to use, but I think we have to put limits in what they're allowed to access. And that comes from that comes from the government. At the end of the day, they're the ones with the FBI that choose to shut down sites or monitor sites. Uh, parents can put locks on things, but these predators are so creative. If they can't get you through Facebook and Instagram, they'll try Snapchat, and then they'll try Google, and then they'll start texting you. And, you know, it's, I, my concern is that it's going to become a real crisis where something extremely bad is going to happen, and then there'll be knee-jerk reactions, and they'll just disconnect everything, which is not good either. Uh, I mean, the DSM, which is the psychiatric manual, has just included video, online video games and social media as an identifiable, identifiable mental illness because it's an addiction. And can you imagine you're treated with an addiction at age 13? Uh, it's, I mean, again, then we're not really even allowing our kids to be kids anymore. It's, they're, they're thrust into an adult world before their brain has even caught up with functioning as an adult. The brain doesn't even comp- stop growing and functioning until 24 when the frontal lobes are done. And that's, the frontal lobe is our executive function, our behaviors, our risk taking, um, things like that. Um, that doesn't fully develop until 24. So you can imagine the vulnerability and the difficulty teenagers at 13, 15, 17 have. And that's why we have so many car accidents when they become new drivers at 17. It's risk taking. It's, it's, they're not able to understand the full consequences of their actions. Well, the same is true on social media. And so, you know, there's got to be way more checks and balances. But I, I think it's going to get worse. They call suicide in America right now, the silent catastrophe. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, it's, and it's true, too. And, it's, and it kind of goes to some folks in their 20s saying that they're getting old because that kind of annoys me when folks say that. But when, I, when you think about it, it's like with all the social media and everything advancing at such a rapid pace of technology, it's like, well, yeah, you got to take all that in stimulation from all sorts of different areas that can actually feed into it and speed up the aging process in a way, too. Well, and again, I mean, we are expecting our children to be adults. When, when you have 13-year-old girls having plastic surgery because they want to look like, for example, Kim Kardashian, we know that, that as adults, we know that's unrealistic. And we know, we know so many things, you know, things that are touched up, has a slew of staff to create that, that it, this is just an image that is portrayed in public. But what they see is what they want to attain because to them, they think that is perfection and that is what will make them famous and loved and attract, you know, a future partner and make them popular and it's not true. I mean, I know. Yes, I'm 55. So, of course, I didn't have social media. Um, I, my competition was a pinup of Cindy Crawford or Farrah Fawcett. And we all had the hair. And we wanted to wear the clothes. That's understandable. But when you actually want to have breast implants at 13, when, when your breasts aren't even developed or have um, lip implants, to me, that's that's. That is so sad and so scary because when you go into adult life, you're going to be very materialistic and self-absorbed and that's going to lead you to problems as well. You know, everyone is setting themselves up for a huge, huge shock because real life, once you become an adult, is very scary and there's some harsh things you have to deal with. And I think that's why... You know, so many turn to addiction and fraud and theft and crime because they still want to emulate their their heroines and their heroes. And in real life, that's very difficult to do. And so, yes, it's um, it's a very difficult time. And as I said, we can't put the blame on the kids and their parents and their teachers 
this is a this is a society problem and together society are the ones that have to work together to help us figure it out for the kids that's right that's right and I love the fact that on your website you have this wonderful thing called your self-help plan. Yes. Which is freaking phenomenal, and folks love to usually see routines and everything like that. So what led you to developing that? Because that is really amazing. And it so, could probably help out someone too. So when I wrote the book, I decided I really wanted it to be like, I guess, one-stop shopping. So I have the blog. And then I decided that I would include in the second part excerpts from my journal because I journaled all the way through. And I also made a point of expressing gratitude every day. And so what I want to show is the journal shows how things start to improve, but also shows that even in my darkest days, I suddenly express gratitude for one thing. And gratitude is simple. It's like just seeing a beautiful flower or horses running through the meadow, or even going to Starbucks and getting a free drink. And that was the, the gratitude. And then I developed my self-help plan, and it was things that helped me. And I included them in the book, not as something that every single person has to follow, but maybe they could read them and think, oh, you know what, this is something I could do to help them develop their own self-help plan because we're all different. But it's healing is, it's long and you've got to be very patient and strong because you love ups and downs. But the self-help plan is self-care for yourself. If you can't care for yourself and start loving yourself, then you're going to have a problem moving forward. And so the self-help plan is express gratitude for one thing a day. Smile. Mine was, you know, treat yourself to a nice bubble bath. Play music that you enjoy. I colored, color. I found coloring was the most therapeutic because it enables you to totally focus your your mind on the coloring and distracts from the, the negative thoughts and the hopeless thoughts that take over your life when you're depressed. It was paint your toenails a funky color. And even men can do that. I mean, I've met so many men that love painting their toenails um (laughs) you know no i have i mean not their fingernails per se but that you know their toenails and it's not pink they'll go for the you know the deep blues and the black but it's something that you know um treat you you know if you go to starbucks treat yourself to you know a really nice warm comforting drink and it's just doing those things that enables you to take care of yourself that day in the moment. It's not materialistic of run out and buy the most expensive pairs of shoes because one, you're not going to be able to do it because you're depressed. And even if you get through the task of doing it, you will not want to wear them. And so it's, it's the mindful things of what can I do today when I'm cocooned in my rabbit hole, lots of people liken it to feel like they're underwater. Others think like they're stuck in a cornfield and they can't find a way out. But what, what, treat yourself. Do something that's going to make you feel good that you've accomplished it. And so that was the self-help tips that I used. And there were a lot of them. Uh, and then the other part was resources. I wanted to include resources for mental illness, depression, post-traumatic stress, suicide. So if they wanted to go to a particular website or if they were having difficulties, the numbers they could call to reach out for help because I didn't want them to close the book and say, okay, now I understand what I need to do and I think I can make this step, but I need help. What do I do now? I wanted them to actually look and go, okay, I can go to this number. And actually on my website, I've extended it that not only does it have all the Canadian numbers, I've also got every single mental health resource and suicide resource in the States. And then for suicide, I have every, world, every worldwide global suicide prevention number. Uh, Because I'm very cognizant that people from all over the world are are going to my website. And then I made a point of including articles. And so 
there's articles on bullying and there's articles on depression and then there's very specific articles on mental illness for children and teenagers written on a level that they can understand so they could go and read it and get you know understand okay this is me and he's 14 and he went through the same thing so there's that connection but it's also enabling the parents and family to go and read those articles because it may it'll help them understand their child or their teenager more and maybe adopt strategies that will that will help it, it to me education is empowering the more we know the better chance we have of helping someone and helping ourselves to continue to move forward and there's also my dementia uh, articles i wrote dementia articles for a year for an online news um, forum and every month for the past 16 months um, at one sunday a month i appear on caregivers with hope hosted by uh, Peter Rosenberger in uh, Nashville. And I've been on his live radio show every single month. And so um, I give advice on specific topics that will help the caregivers who are looking after a person with dementia. So there's a lot of articles in there. I wanted it to be very supportive and educational and empowering, not just, here's me, look at me, here's my book, buy it, goodbye. Uh, That wasn't the point. I'm on there, my bio, what I've done, the upcoming shows, you can link to other shows I've already done, and the book info is there, but that's just part of it. Um, I feel the most important is the access to articles and phone numbers and websites and resources, and that's why I made a point of putting my self-help plan on there, so they could go there and think, oh, okay, I get what she's saying. It's not, the, it's not the big material things that are self-care. It's the little things. It's the standing outside and taking a breath of air. It's the, it's the first snowfall. If you can't make a snow angel, just catch snowflakes on your tongue. You'd be surprised how that makes you feel. It really does. You know, feel sunlight on your face. It's, it's the simple things. It takes you back to mindfulness and you will find that when you're in the rabbit hole or wherever you are those are the little things that give you the courage and the confidence to take another step forward and another step forward and and you will start to see that your that your days are not as bad as they were the day before if that makes sense oh yeah all sorts of coins all sorts of sense right there that's right indeed. That's right indeed. And also the fact that you mentioned watching some cartoons in there too. Is yes. That's probably oh. absent to your inner child too. Yes. I, um, you have to laugh. And I mean, I'm a Brit, so I, I was able to laugh at myself and everything all the way through because that kept me going. But yes, I ordered Pinky and the Brain Anniversary Edition because I love them. And so I ordered them and I would watch them. And at the beginning, you kind of, you're so inert, you can just about go, ha, ha, ha. And then as you get better, you're actually looking forward to watching them. And it just, as you know, humor is a great release. It, it, it just does something to your body. Um, exercise is so important. And I know that everyone's thinking, I can't possibly. I, I argued with myself. I dragged myself out on my bike. I cried riding my bike. I, there's a part in the bike where I was actually riding with snot coming all out of my nose, going all over my face. But it, it, it triggers the endorphins in the brain. So a little bit of exercise helps. And that endorphin rush helps you feel a little better. And so the self-care is that. It's exercise. It's take your medications. Go and see your doctor. Go and see your counselor. Those are the things that will help you become stronger and be the better person. And it's ultimately, it's taking control back of your life. You feel when you have a depression or a mental illness, you've handed control to someone else. This is now taking back control of your life. And these are the, these are the tactics that start doing it. Reading up on thing, depression. And what can you do? And also, it's 
making a routine for yourself, you know, writing down today, I'm going to do five things. And even if those five things take you all day, which they probably will, at the end of the day, you can say, look at this. I brushed my hair. I made my bed. I cleaned my teeth. And yeah, I took a shower at six o'clock in the evening. But guess what? I did it. And it's those things. Because if you just become almost comatose in bed, you know, that's it. You're going to lose yourself and in the darkness and you will never get out. And so it really is. You have to ask yourself every day, do I want to live or do I want to die? And that, those were the questions I asked myself every day. And everyone wants to live. And so it's like, okay, Tracy, what do you have to do today to keep going? And it was, okay, first thing, get out of bed. Go, up, go and take your pills. Okay, now have your breakfast. Go and make your bed. I found making the bed and putting all my fancy throat pillows, being a woman, all that frou-frou stuff, but making the bed mm-hmm. made, made me more reluctant to get back in and mess up the bed. Uh, you know, and it's, it's wash your hair, brush your hair. It, it's, it's those little things because for all, all those listening that are either depressed right now or have been there, they will know when I say that's the last thing you want to do. It, is, it took me 30 minutes to clean my teeth because it's not just the mental and the emotional, it's the physical. You feel like you're encased in cement and you can hardly move or walk and the pain is unbearable. And it's all part of depression. I, I thought I had something else going on. And that's another reason why I wrote the book because people don't get the physical components And so it was necessary to let them know that it's an entire body, mind, illness, and everything everything has to heal in time. It's not just, it won't heal tomorrow and it won't heal in three months, but it will over time. Yeah, it's it's really true. And I think I was listening to, I forgot which interview it was, one of your past interviews where, Many folks have been told you, like, hey, you look really, really good. Like, how are you depressed? And then they don't actually look deep into your eyes and realize, hey, you're actually yeah. going through something. So have has it gotten any better? Because it's been almost four years now. Has the cement somewhat been cracked a little? It has been easier to move, per yeah, se, over yeah. the past few years? Yeah, so I would say, um, so August 20, uh, 2015, I fell down the rabbit hole. Um, towards the end of 2017, that's, uh, that's when I was preparing to publish the book. That's when I started to see the light at the coming, more sunlight in the rabbit hole. And I was able to find my way out. It took time, but I would be able to get out and I would have longer good days than bad days. And, you know, the, the problem with depression is, you will go into a remission. So I classify that I'm in what they call a remission or the chronic stage. I still have to take my antidepressants, but it's a slightly lower dose. I still see my doctor, but I don't go as often. It's now like three to four monthly visits. I still see my psychologist every month unless I'm struggling. And then it's a little bit more often. Um, Yes, I get days where I, I am so bad that It's like I wake up and I'm like, who came by in the night and put on the cement shoulder pads and boots again? But because I know I can have good days and I know I've escaped the rabbit hole, I kind of, I I have a chapter and it's called, it's okay to not be okay all the time. And so I kind of just tell myself, okay, Tracy, this is just one of those days. Tomorrow will be better. So just Go back to your routine. Go back to your routine. Keep going. Go to Starbucks. Do your crossword, you know, and come home and journal and express gratitude and just keep moving forward. And then tomorrow you get up and it's and it's better. And so that's what I want to make clear. You will still have bad days, but you came this far. And, And so what I say is 
when I look back to how far I've come, I'm still absolutely amazed I'm here because the suicide was so, so close. Uh, it was a 10 second whisper in my ear that told me to run all, every single time. And I, I, you know, it was for a reason and it's what I'm doing right now. And so, yes, to anyone listening, it will get better. I'm living proof. And I did it on my own. Like I had no partner, no pets, no family, no support system. I did it on my own. I had no choice. I had to get myself to the doctor. I had to get up to take my pills. I had to go grocery shopping. And so if I can do it, anyone can. But just be patient with yourself. We, we become our own worst enemies because we, we like to have a timetable. I would, I would go to my psychologist two years in and say, can you just give me a date when I'm going to be fine? And he would laugh and say, Tracy, we go through this every time. Your, your brain is so, he says, mortally wounded and fractured was how he described it. And it's going to take so long for those wounds to heal. But you're getting better. And you can see that. And so you know, compared to last year, how far you've come. Can you imagine how far you will come in a year's time? And that's what keeps propelling you forward because ultimately we all want to live. We don't want to die. The reason why we want to die is because we want to get rid of the pain. And so, as I said, the book is to give you that hope and then everything in there is to show you that I've kind of walked the same path as you're going through what I did to help me get out, what you can do to start supporting yourself or others that you know to take that next step, that, to keep going. Because on the days that I have faced suicide and there by the grace of God have, not, have just had that 10 second moment to flee, the next day I was so glad I hadn't followed through. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Kevin Hines. He's the only guy that survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And he said the moment he released his fingers from the bridge, he realized he'd made the biggest mistake of his life. And so believe that. Um, you, you keep going. There, there is a light. There absolutely is. And everything you're feeling today will start disappearing slowly and you will start feeling human again, if that's a good term, because you don't feel human. You feel like a solid, inert nothing. You will be a daughter, a wife, a girlfriend, a, a boyfriend, a friend, a, what, you know, whatever gender. You will reclaim that again. You really will. And you will be so much stronger and so much better for it. Um, you, you've seen yourself, right, Doc? I mean, everyone who is an advocate for mental health or mental illness has, has walked the walk and talked the talk. Um, because they know, who else can you identify with but a person that's been there? And so that's why we're all so vocal about sharing our stories to help others, but also the more we talk, the more we can get rid of that stigma that's holding so many people back from getting help. That's right. That's right. Indeed. One of the best people to learn from is those who have been through that same situation. So any plans for a possible book number two or just going to continue promoting this one and just giving speeches to the wonderful children and the adults? I think probably uh, for the next, I'm hoping six months or so I can uh, I can give more presentations, start helping our kids, and then at some point there will likely be a book number two. Um, lots of people are asking me, so I anticipate it, there will be. It may be slightly different, but yes, I think there will. Um, but for now, it's just really focused on getting the message out and let's get people to start opening their eyes and and their ears and listening to their kids, listening to what they are saying to them or not saying to them and reaching out and being there for them so we 
we don't have to put them through the bullying and going through a depression or an anxiety without support and ultimately decide, making that fateful decision. We don't want them to get to that point. And so that's what my, my commitment is right now. I'm, I'm organizing an event in Seattle for the spring, which will be for the kids and the teenagers. Um, and we have 500 guests, guests come in so far, six guest speakers, including a celebrity. And it's, that is what it is. It is all about mental illness and suicide. And what can we do as a community Everyone, youth leaders, churches, business people, parents, families, friends, teachers, schools, counsellors. What can we do together to start supporting our kids so they don't decide to take a loaded shotgun or drive their car off a cliff because they can't take the pain? So that's, that's the mission. Oh, that's right. And a worthy mission indeed. So speaking of youth, if you were to wake up tomorrow and you were 25 again in the current year and you get to keep all of your knowledge and experience, what would be the first thing you do based off the wisdom that you gained? What would I do? Don't sweat the small stuff. And do never allow people to take your power. Stand tall in your own power and your values. Do not allow people to bully you, badmouth you, intimidate you. Stand in your own power and love and respect yourself. If you can do that, you will be able to get through adulthood and you will face problems head on. Because if you can love yourself and you have very good ethics and values and confidence, you know yourself. That can propel you to help other people. Be kind. There's not enough kindness and understanding in the world. Be kind. Don't engage in bullying. Don't engage in gossip. It's, it's, it's harmful words. Stand true to yourself. That's what I would say to myself at 25. And go and help others. Always pay it forward and be kind. Life is too short. Amen to that. Indeed, life is too short, shorter than a one-foot-tall brick wall. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Woohoo! Beautiful. Well, all righty. For those who want to keep in touch with you and be updated, especially when that big event in Seattle is taking okay. place, what's the best way to get in contact with you? i say the best way would be on my website, um, the, all the information will be there, and it also will connect to all the different social media links I'm on, because I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest and LinkedIn. But just go to www.tracymaxfield.com, or even just put in my name, or even put Escape in the Rabbit Hole, and you'll find me. It's all there. <laughs> That's right. Maybe even might find a picture of Tracy with bunny ears from escaping the rabbit hole, too, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that was in my younger days. <laughs> oh, don't worry. You're 55 and fabulous. It, it can still happen. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. I got four eyes. I'll definitely see. Well, all righty. So any parting words for the folks still listening? Keep going. You are not alone. You are absolutely not alone. If you, if you feel you are, just go to my website. There's a contact form. It comes straight to my email. I will respond. You are not alone. And life is worth living. And I beg you, keep going. You will be so glad that you keep going. You, so, you have a wonderful future. You have no idea. Right now, it's dark, but keep going. The light is there. It absolutely is. Hey there, buddy. Looks like you made it to the end of this episode. Since you made it to the end of this episode, do both of us a favor and stop being greedy and share this episode with your friends and your fellow podcast lovers, especially those who have book clubs and want to listen to the authors who write some amazing books. Be sure to check out the rest of the backlog, too, while you're at it, and share all those, too. 
And in order to make the rest of your week the best of your week, remember to advance others to advance yourself.